Okay, welcome. Um, this is Rabbi Shlomo Slavkin from the Marriage Restoration Project, and um, we're fortunate today to have a, our guest, uh, Alisa Di Lorenzo from One Extraordinary Marriage, and it's really wonderful to have you here. Oh, it's and, wonderful to be here. Yeah, and I can't wait to hear about your journey. It, you know, one of the things that, I, you know, reading about your work with Tony is that you know, working together as a couple and sharing mm -hmm. your own story and also kind of how your personal story really impacted your program that you've created and the work that you do with couples. You know, I resonate with that quite a bit because my, my wife Rifka and I, we kind of got into this ourselves first and then we began, you know, then I became a, you know, a Mago therapist and working with couples. So um, you know, that was one thing that I felt like it's, it's really just to be able to go through it on your own and then help couples is much different than just learning about something in school and Know, trying some technique and hoping it works. You really know you believe in what you're doing. So I'm excited to hear about your process and and your six pillars uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. Good. So tell me, tell us a little bit um, if you want to just kind of in a nutshell, your personal story, kind of how you got into working with couples. Sure. Well, Tony and I have been married for 24 years and the first, you know, the first decade, the first 10, 11 years were just not, not great. Um, we really struggled. We, we struggled sexually. We struggled to emotionally connect. Um, we had our children in that period of time, but it, we got caught in the trenches and we, we really found ourselves um, in 2008 just at a crossroads trying to figure out what, what's next for us. Our kids were two and five and we were, we were looking at the future and thinking we're either going to get divorced now we're going to wait until, you know, that two-year-old turned 18, which would be, you know, at that point in time, we were looking at 16 years, or we were going to do something radical. And at that point, we said, you know what, divorce is not an option, either now or in the future. So what are we going to do that's going to be radical? And it was at that point in time that we, we made the decision to do a 60-day sex challenge, to just, you know, Tony suggested it. I immediately said no, because I thought he was crazy. We weren't having sex. So how could we possibly do 60 days? And it was in that place where literally the next day I was standing with a basket full of laundry in my garage. And I just, I heard the voice of God say, are you really not willing to try? Are you, are you giving up on your marriage? This is not a crazy thing that he's asked you to do. He just wants you to make him a priority. And it was from that moment when I, you know, Tony came home from work and I said, yes, that literally everything changed and has been, you know, since that point in time in 2008 that we, or yeah, in 2008, we're, we've been focused on not just changing our marriage, but getting to a place where we could actually equip others to transform their marriage as well. Wow. That's an amazing story and amazing gift that you're offering to see that dramatic transformation that you had. And then not just to take it for yourself, but to actually use that uh, wisdom that you, that you learned from your experience to share with others and to make an impact in the world. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite a journey. I mean, we never, we never anticipated that what started there in 2008 would be what one extraordinary marriage is today. It was really one of those things where um, we did our sex challenge. We completed 40 out of 60 days and then we were invited to speak at a marriage conference and we shared that story. And then people were saying, well, what's next? And, and there wasn't a what's next at that point in time. We hadn't thought past what we'd already done. And it was from there that in January of 2010, we, we started the One Extraordinary Marriage Show and we've been podcasting every week since, wow. since 2010, beginning of 2010. Oh, that's a long time, 10 years. <laughs> oh, to, to consistency, to, you know, that's a hard to... To, to do that consistently. It's one thing to mm -hmm. do it consistently for so many years. It's, that's amazing. Now, were you coaching at the time when you were speaking at that conference or that someone just found you or how did that work? I went, it was actually, it was the marriage conference for the church that we were attending at the time. Oh, okay. And our when we had started the challenge, we had notified our marriage and family pastors and just said, hey, we're doing this. We let them know just as a form of accountability um, that, that we were taking this challenge on in our marriage. And so as they were preparing for the conference the next year, they're like, we just want you to share your story. Just, <laughs> just share it. And the coaching didn't actually come about until 2013. 
Um, and, you know, as we started the podcast, people would send us emails and, and ask for insights and, well, how did you and Tony navigate this or, or how did you, you know, break through not being able to initiate or, or how do I have these conversations? And I kept hearing all of these questions. And so then it really became what, what's next, right? What is the next, you know, evolution of what we're doing more than just doing a podcast once a week. That's when I went and got certified as a coach and started an incredible journey of being privileged to work with people and, and in this most intimate relationship. That's great. And how do couples typically find you through, through the podcast? Is that how they initially get to you? A lot of people do find us through the podcast um, with so many shows, friends share shows, they, they see something on Instagram, they listen to a show. That's the primary way. Um, and it also brings a level of comfort because they've heard my voice. Um, they've got some idea of my personality. And so by the time, you know, they go through the application process and we start coaching, we literally hit the ground running in our very first session because they know me actually better than I know them. And so it, there's a level of trust that has been built up just by listening to the podcast. Yeah, that's important because, you know, especially such a delicate issue, there's, there's often a lot of resistance, especially well, usually one one spouse is a little bit more resistant than the other. Sure. I don't. I don't know if you're work. Are you working with both both couples, or sometimes you're working with one one spouse? Over the I, I do both. Uh, partly because, like you said, sometimes there's resistance from one spouse that isn't quite ready to jump in, and sometimes I also find with my clients that somebody just identifies an area of themselves or of the marriage that they want to work on. And they know that they've just got to get focused on this themselves and they'll just start coaching. And then sometimes down the road, their spouse will join them, but not always. Yeah. So it can work either, either way, but meaning the work that you do with the individual can, can impact the whole overall relationship because when one person changes, it kind of shifts the energy. 100% mm -hmm. believe that. But it's great because if they already have are following you, then they kind of bought into your process and mm -hmm. it makes it much easier to work. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a headache. Yeah. You're pushing up against somebody's like, especially when a couple comes, one if one person's kind of always said there's a dragger and a draggy. Even <laughs> if and if one person's kind of pushing up against you the whole time, it's like, I mean, that's where you need to go in the work, but it's it definitely saves time when you have willing participants and committed participants. I would agree. And you know, it's amazing. It's amazing even just what happens when somebody takes action. You know, like you said, there's the draggy and then the dragger. Um, but just that first step of let's fill out the application of let's just have a get to know you phone call. Let's just see if this is going to work for us. It's amazing how much transformation can happen with a couple just making the decision yeah. that they want to get help. Um, you know, that's really, I think, so much the initial barrier. Are we going to do something? Right. That's, that's crucial because that's, it's that commitment to your relationship to make it a priority to actually do something about it instead of just, well, should I, should I not? I'm not really fully into it. I'm not fully invested. And right. If you're not fully invested, you're not going to, it's not going to go anywhere. It's hard mm -hmm. because especially when it comes to, you know, I know when the way that we do, when I work with couples, I don't do your typical weekly sessions I do a two day intensive and it requires a real investment into the, the pro forget it besides you know financially or time wise but just the idea that we're really committing to doing something and it's not just through yeah. kind of coming one time and seeing how it goes you know we really like have to commit and you know it definitely makes better it makes it changes the whole energy and creates better easier couples to work with meaning more effective results because we have people that really have made that decision to take action and to take their relationship seriously well, and I'm sure you find that with that level of intentionality comes tremendous transformation because if they're willing to commit to two days, a two day intensive, um, whether they have to arrange childcare or, you know, travel or whatever that is, they want it to work. They want, they want the breakthrough. And so you're already starting from that positive headspace yeah. uh, to be able to equip them to be transformed. Exactly. And that's really what I think commitment is like we can teach them all the tools. We, you know, there are plenty of wonderful tools we can teach couples, but if they're not committed, it's not going to do anything. But mm -hmm. once you have that commitment, that's like I would say it's always it's like half the battle to get them in there. So absolutely, it's good that you're kind of um, that people are being you know kind of indoctrinated and and bought into the process and really excited about doing the work with you. That 
-hmm. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about the the six pillars that you've developed? Yeah. Those? So back back in 2010, you know, when Tony and I were starting everything, we wrote our first book called Strip Down: 13 Keys to Unlocking Intimacy in Your Marriage. And you know, as we were exploring what had happened to us during our 60 day sex challenge, we realized that even though the sexual intimacy had been the catalyst for the transformation in our marriage, it wasn't the only area of our marriage that was transformed. We found that the conversations we were having were ridiculously good. Uh, you know, we were talking like we had talked back when we were recording one another and those conversations that had seemingly, you know, just disappeared for 10 years were back again. We, we found that we were enjoying spending time together. We were more physically into There were all of these things that started to happen. And we realized that, that this word intimacy, you know, had been so wrapped around sex and sexual intimacy. And yet there are so many other ways within marriage to be close and connected to your spouse. And that's really where we started talking about different forms of intimacy. And, you know, over the last 10 years, we've been in this perpetual state of refining. What are those pillars? What does this look like? What is important in a marriage? What are the areas that couples can really, you know, if they know that these, these strengths exist, if they know that these foundational pieces exist, then they can actually do something and be equipped to take action. And so the six pillars are, you know, your emotional intimacy. So what are the conversations that you're having? What, what's the body language? What's all of that happening on that emotional level? Then you have your physical intimacy. So that's all your touch, um, all the different forms of touch and not necessarily the ones that lead to sexual intimacy because we actually separate that out. Um, you have your financial intimacy, right? right. Couples, you know, individuals often are taught not to talk about money or, you know, you don't talk about money with people. And, you know, it's one of the things you're not supposed to ask people about. And yet in marriage, you, you got to pay the bills, you got to, you know, plan for your future, all this kind of stuff. Um, so financial intimacy, spiritual intimacy, you know, there's a level of intimacy that comes as couples, you know, share their faith and discuss their faith faith journeys and, and worship together and all of that, then you have your recreational intimacy. You know, what are the things that you do together as a couple that don't necessarily involve your children or, you know, your house of faith or whatever that is, like just, just the two of you. Um, and then finally, you're, we always wrap up with the sexual intimacy because that's the one everybody would expects to start with. Right. But it's looking at all of those from a really holistic uh, point of view and saying, you know, when we, when we think of like ancient Greece and we think of, you know, the part that anything that had pillars, right? There was such a, a such an image of strength in the pillars and those old buildings and, and the Roman Colosseum and things like that, like the strength in the pillars. And so when couples can identify, oh, maybe this pillar's got some cracks in it. We're not as close or as connected. Then we can come alongside with strategy around that. And they don't feel like the whole marriage is falling apart. It's just what pillar needs to be strengthened. Mm. That's interesting because some couples often feel like they're they're really not coming in with a lot of hope often. Mm -hmm. um, and to help them realize that maybe they do have some areas that are strong and it just you need to strengthen if you know here's a few with a few cracks here or there. Yeah. Um, though sometimes I guess you know I would say that they're they're connected and related. Do you find that that you have to I guess that you can work on all of them simultaneously or one leads to the other or or maybe both? Well, obviously the emotional intimacy is sort of that, that one key foundational piece because the conversations that you have, how you're expressing your emotions, that's the one that, that I often start with because that, you know, whether you're talking about money or faith or what we're going to do on a Friday night or are we having, like that comes out of the conversations that the two of you have. And then it really becomes a matter of looking at, you know, each couple as an individual and saying, you know what, where are those areas that you have strength and how can we apply the skills that you have, whether it's, you know, skills that you have professionally or skills that the two of you have relationally in areas where you have strength in the areas where you, you desire to improve. Because what I've discovered over all of these years of coaching is that most people have the skills that they need. They just don't know how to apply them to the marriage. Hmm. And it's a matter of, you know, creating those aha moments to say, okay, well, if you do this, you know, case in point, I'm working with a, an orthodontist and his wife. Here's the guy that spends all day making tiny little adjustments in kids' teeth to 
over time create a long-term beautiful perfect smile when i was talking to him the other day i said you know all we're trying to do is the same thing in your marriage make tiny little adjustments over time, just like you do in your office. And you could see the light bulb go on that he doesn't have to, you know, in a broad brush, change everything. He doesn't have to cross the finish line tomorrow. He just has to make incremental little changes. And so being able to connect the dots for him and he's like, oh, I can do this that's because amazing. that's what I do on a daily basis. So making it doable as opposed mm -hmm. to this is daunting tasks. It's like, well, how am I ever, I'm ever going to accomplish this? Correct. That's not an overnight success, but it's a more of a process that you have to just mm -hmm. put in that effort. Yeah. Absolutely. But you're saying that the emotional, yeah, the emotional intimacy is definitely the basis for all of them. Because if you don't mm -hmm. feel emotionally connected and safe to be able to open up and share and to feel heard, then, you know, <laughs> nothing <laughs> else is going to happen. You can't get anywhere. And it's interesting because a lot, a lot of times people ask, you know, saying they have physical intimacy challenges mm -hmm. and you know i'm i'm not i mean obviously it comes up as working with a couple but i'm not spe you know, specifically working with you know, as a sex therapist that's not my okay. credentials but i always say that if you work on the emotional intimacy if you can feel connected you can feel safe with each other then mm -hmm. you know unless there's some trauma there um which is another piece but you know, if, if that's really what's getting in the way, just not feeling connected, not feeling close, that developing the emotional intimacy can help you lead to feeling more comfortable and bringing back intimacy in the other areas. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. I've often told folks um, it's very hard to be physically naked and 100% present if you don't have the emotional connection. You know, if, if you don't feel it, that you can be vulnerable, yes, anyone can have sex, but if it's truly intimacy, it's going to have that emotional component to it. And would you say that's probably more so for women, you find that more so for women than men? Women. More so, but it's been really interesting um, to find out over the years just how many men actually struggle with that hmm. as well. You know, maybe because they were never taught to share their feelings or I'm working with a couple right now where he was, he never had to apologize. And they've experienced something in their marriage where the wife desperately needs to hear an apology. And it, I was talking with them and, and I asked the husband, I said, have you ever, like when you were a kid, did your parents make you apologize? And he's like, never, we just didn't talk about things. And then they would just blow over. And so here's a 40 year old guy who has to learn how to apologize and has to learn how to share those feelings because his wife is ready. She's like, please just apologize to me. Mm -hmm. But until he can get into that place of emotional safety, that it's going to be okay for him to share his feelings. There, we're, we're slowly peeling back the layers of that onion to be able to get him in a safe place to be able to do that. Interesting. And that's what she needs. What she needs most from him is the, hard, the hardest thing for him to do because he mm -hmm. never learned how to do that. Yeah. And it's, you just never know. Um, where, you know, and it's the beauty of working with people is that everyone's got such a unique story. And how can you, you know, and I'm sure you know this as a therapist, how can you come alongside and equip them to have that breakthrough? And so you see those things and you're like, oh, well, we just have to work on learning how to apologize. Right. Who knew? But they didn't think that's what the, what the issue was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it's, it's so important to have somebody else who's not kind of in the in the story, the Talmud says a person who is in is in prison is not able to get themselves out of jail. So they, you know, you need somebody else to be able to do it. Even if you, there's a story. There was um, someone. There was a rabbi who needed to be. He was sick, and he was able to heal other people, but he needed just somebody else to heal him because wow. he didn't heal himself. So it's so important to have that fresh, non-biased, you know, viewpoint to be able to see see from kind of a bird's eye view what's going mm -hmm. on. And for you, it probably was a lot. It was like, I'm not going to say obvious, almost what they needed to do. Well, and I think, I think that's the value. And we're often not taught that about marriage, that there will be times where we'll be blind to what we need to do or, or to the faults that we have that are just, maybe they've just been part of who we are for our entire lives. And they're causing an issue between us and our spouse. But the dance has just gotten so familiar between husband and wife and yet when you bring in a third party, when you find a trusted coach or a trusted therapist, 
all of a sudden you don't have to keep having that same friction point. You know, somebody that, that is well-versed in what they're doing can help you to have that breakthrough. And then all of a sudden it's like you have a brand new marriage because you're not bumping up against that same destructive behavior, that same destructive thought pattern. It's actually released. And then you get to step into it, you know, what your marriage was designed to be. Man, it's interesting because you're saying it seems like there's it's not like there are people get overwhelmed and like I have so many issues, but you know, it sounds like what you're saying is there's usually one or two kind of main main sources of friction that kind of they're bumping up against. I mean, I deal with folks literally every marriage problem I've probably over the last, you know, eight years now, eight years or so, um, have run into, but every, I mean, I deal with everything from infidelity to, you know, especially this year, you know, differences of opinion on the political climate and, you know, the election of 2020 and, you know, how do we navigate that and how do we navigate in-laws? I mean, it's really, you know, sexlessness. It, if, if it can happen in a marriage, I've probably dealt with it. Yeah. You know, it, it just depends on how, the willingness I and mean, this goes back to what you were saying about your intensives, right? The willingness to dig deep and be challenged to try something new. And do you find a lot of um, resistance to that or are most people are ready? I think for the most part, the folks that I work with are ready. Um, Many of them have gotten to the point where, and I'll see it on their applications because I have an application for coaching, where it's either now or never because they know their next step is divorce. Mm -hmm. And so at that point in time, we have to make a change. And, you know, we often say on the podcast, I'm like, please don't wait till that point. But statistically, I know um, just from a lot of the research that I've seen that most couples will wait six or seven years before they do something. And that's when it gets a little dicey because, you know, if you've been waiting that long, your spouse may not be willing to engage in the process. Do you find that that to be common when, do you find that people, you get people that are, one person's already kind of out the door? I wouldn't say that's common, uh, but I have run into that. And, you know, as a marriage coach, I can only work as hard as both parties are willing to work yeah. to, to save their marriage. Um, but truth be told, I've seen miracles happen where, you know, couples really thought, you know, I was just talking to a couple the other night when I met them in August, she was ready to divorce. She was like, I'm done. And basically I'm giving this one chance. And where they are now, four and a half months later of just being really focused, really intentional, being willing to try new strategies she, you know, she was telling me about all the Christmas presents under the tree and what they're going to be doing, you know, beginning of next year and how they just got a, you know, a new puppy and all of these things that would have seemed virtually impossible if they hadn't taken the action. And, you know, I just feel like I have the privilege to be the conduit for a couple to have their own breakthrough. Um, I really feel that the coaching that I do because I pray before, during, and after my sessions. And so it's, I, I just get to be a, a mouthpiece for, you know, what God wants to do in their marriage. And so that's how I know that when I'm able to connect the dots, like with that orthodontist, that's not me, that, that was God using me to be able to speak exactly how he needed to hear it. Yeah. I mean, that's so important to have that, to be, to have that humility as a clinician and to, mm -hmm to realize, you know, not to impose yourself on the couple to really help facilitate their healing. Yeah. It's so gratifying to be able to hear that, to see that someone's coming in, you know, ready to leave and then in such a good place now. Yeah, this has been, this has actually been a great week because I've had three couples that um, just in this week alone that really thought they were headed to divorce. And in all three instances, um, the spouse that was really the more resistant or kind of one foot out the door, uh, within the last week or two has had the epiphany moment that the marriage is what they want to fight for. And so three couples that, that I wasn't actually sure about, and they're all looking at 2021 and they're like, we're staying married. It's so and so, yeah, that's the kind of thing that just puts a smile on your face. Cause you're like, all right, let's, let's do this. It makes it all worth, worth it. <laughs> all the work that you're doing, it makes it worth it to, to see that. Definitely. Definitely. 
And I think though that, you know, if somebody, if somebody is actually going to wind up engaging in your services and really work and deciding to work, even if they think this is a last ditch effort, there's a part of them that really wants to make it work. They just don't, couples don't have the hope. They don't really see how is it going to be any different? And that's, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard to, for them to see that, but the challenge is the people who don't, the people who don't come in, the people who mm-hmm. are trying to convince them or, you know, when the spouse is trying to convince them and they don't get help, the, um, you know, of course it makes it much more difficult, even if one person's trying to work on themselves, if, if other person's completely checked out or, or if they're actively having an affair, mm-hmm. and it can make it really hard. Well, I think you used a really significant word there. You used the word hope. And one, this has been a really tough year on a lot of people. A lot of people have felt hopeless. Um, you know, when, when marriages are in trouble, when there are challenges, there aren't a lot of places out there where you can actually find hope. I mean, if we look, if we look at news, if we look at magazines, everything is talking about divorces and divorce rates and, you know, the, how many people are ending up divorced. And, and so it is that coming against that mindset that everything has to end in divorce and say, but wait, what if you just had the tools and strategies to do something different? What if you were equipped? What if most of us don't go to marriage school before we get married, but we we still can get a marriage license, but you don't actually have, you know, it's like, if you get a driver's license, you have to go to driving school. You get a marriage license by showing up and signing your name and giving them a check. Right. There's no requirements. I mean, I know no that some, some clergy require it before they marry you, but it's not, it's limited. It, it is limited. And, you know, a lot of what gets discussed there, we don't know what we don't know until we get married. And all of a sudden you're living with someone and you're like, right. oh, right. I didn't, right. You don't want to believe in that, in that romantic stage. You don't want to believe that that power struggle is going to happen. And so true. It's a, it's a rude awakening. And <sighs> it's, it's so important. And that's the thing. It doesn't come, marriage doesn't come with an instruction manual. We don't have to go to school for it. We don't really know what we're getting ourselves into. It, it, it should just be expected that it's going to be a challenge and that people, that there's something that we all need to learn to have mm-hmm. a better relationship. And when you can come from that place, it's not so, you don't feel like such a failure or like your all hope is lost because it's not going the way you were intending. Mm-hmm. This is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And now we just need to get the tools to, to, to take it to a better place. Well, I love that we're sitting here in your office because I can see all, you know, the many volumes behind you. And, you know, in so many areas of our lives, whether it's professionally, whether it's personal, we will continue to get the education. We will continue to learn. And yet there's this, you know, rather significant relationship called marriage that, we, like you said, and we were talking about a minute ago, we can just get a license and go. And there's no expectation that we would continue to learn. And, and that's why, you know, a lot of times people find themselves in a place where they don't read all the books or find coaching or reach out to a therapist until the wheels are falling off. And, and you know, one of the things that Tony and I love is when we hear from folks that are single or dating or engaged that are listening to the show and they're listening to a couple talk about marriage before they get married, because they just want to know how to do it better, even though they've not been in the relationship. Yeah, it's always it's always good to to get that information as early as possible. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. great to get people try, trying to prevent you know to start off on the in the right place. And oh, to, I'm always so grateful when they write in. I'm like, I say to myself, say, "Thank you, thank you for thank you for caring enough about your future marriage to do something proactive before you're even in that place." You know, how different will those relationships be if they're focusing on it before it's even there and focusing on, on being equipped and thinking through what are those conversations, you know, when, when Tony and I are, are talking about like, how are you going to navigate the political climate? How are you going to navigate, you know, doing a sex challenge? How are you going to navigate, you know, teenagers who knock on your door when you're trying, like, whatever it is, we're having these conversations. People are thinking, oh, well, if Tony and Elisa can talk about it, I can probably talk about that. Right. And it's just this equipping that continues to happen through the podcast. That's what you get the skills and normalizing it for them. Mm-hmm. It's doable. And then, then when they do get a rough patch down, even though it, they're still going to be in la la land, but sure. when they do get a rough patch, they know that there's, there is a better way that there is that people do have challenges and people can overcome them. And there's mm-hmm. there are tools that can help them. Yeah. yeah. And it, you know, that enables them to stay committed to really doing what they need to, 
to create a great marriage. Well, and so much of it does go back to that commitment and consistency. You know, will you do the little things on a consistent basis to have an extraordinary relationship? Because it's the little things. Um, you know, in, in Song of Songs, you know, I think it's 2.15 that talks about the little foxes and, and how the little foxes destroy the vine. And, you know, so much of that is, it's not these big sweeping things, right? Infidelity happens as a result of lots of little things that have built up over time. It's not like anybody wakes up and says, this is the day I'm going to ruin my marriage. Right. And, and so if we can, if we can get into the habit early on or wherever you are in marriage. Like I, you know, folks listening to the show could be anywhere along the spectrum, but if you make a commitment to saying, I'm not going to let the little foxes in, I'm going to do the little actions to be consistent and to do the things that are actually going to build my marriage. Yeah, that's really, and that, that's hard for people because I think in our, we have this instant gratification in our society. Everything just, we, you know, like our internet speeds, you know, a few seconds too slow and we can't, you know, getting uh, antsy already. Right. We're used to just everything coming our way and replacing things. And to think about like that, you have to commit to something and you have to, mm -hmm. that day, daily effort and you're not going to necessarily see the fruits of your labor until a little while down the road. It's hard to, for someone to have that type of patience mm -hmm. in our society. So it makes it kind of an uphill battle. But the, that's where the desire and the commitment come, comes in. And sometimes you have to do stuff when you don't feel like it. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, Tony and I, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, the secret to what Tony and I have done. And, and we've been intentional. We've taken action, you know, specifically since 2008. But the one thing that we've done for almost 11 years now is once a week, we have had a conversation. We happen to record ours and, and put it out for the podcast. But but we developed the emotional intimacy by making time to talk to one another. And we haven't missed a week. I mean, we, we did it when I was going on a mission trip. We actually recorded two shows. Like this is what, we, what we've woven into our fa the fabric of our marriage. And there's, it, with the instant gratification society, we've lost the, the desire to be consistent over time, but it's consistency over time that actually creates extraordinary. It's not short bursts of being amazing, it's what will you do? I and mean, if you're gonna be married to somebody for 40 or 50 years, the short bursts at the beginning are gonna be a distant memory at 50 years. It's what do you do it's over the length of that time? It's interesting because there's um, that about consistency. There's a um, idea in the, the Talmud talks about when a person goes to, the when they go up to the world to come and they ask them, you know, what a few things about their life and one of the things that did you set uh, uh, fixed times to, for study for studying the oh. torah and it doesn't say like did you learn all all the torah did you understand it all did you do you know what did you accomplish did you set fixed times and so i did oh. that it's that consistency that you're making it because you're making when you make something consistent and you set the time for it it prioritizes it it shows that mm -hmm. this is important to me we said this with date night for you know yeah. You show it, even if we miss it one week, but the idea is that every, you know, Tuesday night at eight o'clock, you're going out. That means your marriage is important enough to set aside time in your schedule to make it happen. And even if you don't succeed every time, but you have that idea. So that's just really resonate with that. It's so, it, it's so important and it's so challenging, but it's, that's, what's going to get you, you know, it's the turtle that kind of win, wins the race. That daily oh, yeah. effort. Yeah. I like that. I hadn't thought about the tortoise yeah. and the hair, but yes, exactly. Exactly. Great analogy. Yeah. But is there, is there any more, Lisa, that you want to share with, um, about the six pillars? Well, I would encourage folks, I mean, you can learn all about us at oneextraordinarymarriage.com, but you know, to really dig into the six pillars of intimacy and, and to start thinking about it as just an alternative way to look at your marriage, right? It, it, it's a tool. We often talk about helping couples to build out their toolbox, right? Not every, you know, when you think about the different pillars, what, what you're going to do to build your emotional intimacy may not be the same thing that you do to build your recreational intimacy, but, but approach your marriage as, you know what, this is our relationship and we've got our set of tools for our toolbox. And we're going to look at these six pillars as ways to strengthen our marriage, as ways to literally lift every part of us 
up so that, you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, we're, we're sitting across the table from one another. And we're like, we've had an incredible marriage. We have focused on one another, we, you know, to use the word that you just used, we've prioritized one another. And, and these six pillars really just equip couples to, to learn different ways to prioritize one another. That's great. I like how you, you really break it down. It just makes it, it's doable. It's not like mm -hmm. you know, the six, you know, only six areas I have to focus on. It's not like a hundred things I have to do. Just, you know, just like, what am I doing in these areas? Check, got to kind of checking yourself to see what you're doing and, and really committing to focusing on, on those and yeah. seeing how that creates that holds up that beautiful edifice that you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is, you know, when you look at those six, I mean, because people will be like, well, why don't you have like parenting intimacy? Well, parenting intimacy falls into your emotional intimacy. It falls into your physical intimacy. You know, you, you, you can navigate virtually any area. We have yet to find one that you can't. Any area of marriage or life or what life is going to throw at you while you're married that isn't going to somehow fit into one of the six pillars or a combination of them because they're really interwoven. And so if we can simplify marriage, people can really step into this place of saying, I can do this. Yeah, We've just created a culture collectively. I think where so many people say, this is hard. I can't do this. I'm just going to throw in the towel. And we really want to come against what's happening in, you know, with the divorce rates. We want to come against people saying, you know, I can't do this and say, wait, you can. Let, let's figure out where, where you've got your cracks and let's, let's equip you. You know, it's not just the knowledge of the six pillars, but the programs, the coaching, the podcast, all of these other things that come around it so that they, you know, start having hope again. Yeah. yeah. You know what? We can do it. It's why we have a hug at the top of every show just to hear from somebody in the one family who has figured out how to do something. And now they have confidence. And once you have confidence in your skills and abilities, you, you can take on the world yeah. or you know, simply have an extraordinary marriage. That's great. Well, it's been a pleasure hearing from you today, Lisa. Really, again, oneextraordinarymarriage.com. <laughs> and if you want to find out more, um, it's been wonderful hearing from you. I really like your, you know, what you've shared and what I've read about your program. And it's just, it just sounds like you're doing really amazing work with couples. And oh, thank you. God should bless you to continue with Tony to do the work that you're doing. Oh, I received that. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Welcome.